Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about optimizing Looker performance on Snowflake. Uh, and I'm very grateful to have Nal Woodward here, um, who's going to do his own introduction, I'm sure, but has done a ton of work uh, on Snowflake in particular to optimize it and help companies really both uh, get their costs under control, which is obviously a thing that, that lots of orgs using Snowflake have to battle with on a you know week by week, day to day basis. Um, and also how to get the most performance out of it. You don't just want to cut costs. You want to make sure that your queries run smoothly. Um, and so excited to have him today. And I'm going to hand over to him uh, in just a second. Um, before I do that, I just want to highlight some of the webinars that we have coming up. Um, so if uh, this is the first time that you are joining us for one of these, uh, we run these webinars every two weeks. Uh, and the we here is Spectacles. Um, Spectacles is a CI tool for Looker. Um, but these talks really aren't to sell spectacles. They're really just to get the Looker community together, um, bring in experts who can talk about really interesting things and um, kind of provide an event space where the community can get together, ask questions um, and kind of do a deep dive on, on topics that are relevant to Looker developers uh, doing work day to day. So um, in two weeks, we'll be doing one on custom map visualizations in Looker. Uh, that'll actually be led by me. So it'll be the first one of these webinars that, that I'll actually uh, lead. We may need someone else to come in and do this intro bit. Um, and then we've got a, a team at Scopely. John Palmer from Scopely is going to come in and talk about how they have scaled their instance for multiple different use cases when they've thought about going multi-instance, how they've got that set up. Um, and so if you want to join either of those, uh, head to spectacles.dev slash webinars. Uh, make sure you get registered. Um, even if you can't make it, we will send the recordings to everyone who's registered after the fact. So it's a, a good enough reason to, uh, to sign up. Um, and then finally, some of you will have heard this before I started, but um, for the Q&A and for all the kind of ongoing commentary, um, we have a Slack channel set up, which we found to be the most effective for kind of having a conversation during these webinars. And so I've just dropped the sign up link again. Um, if you want to join us, I uh, highly recommend it. I think it helps people get the most out of these uh, webinars. Um, and there's a channel called Webinar Snowflake Cost Optimization, which is where we're going to be having the discussion for today. Um, so on that note, I'm going to uh, mute myself, turn my webcam off, and hand over to, to Niall, who's going to take you through the next 20 minutes or so. And then after that, we're going to get back together for the Q&A portion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dylan. OK, thanks very much for uh, coming along, everyone. Uh, we're going to switch over from Spectacles Purple to uh, Select Blue. So uh, yeah, optimizing the looker on Snowflake. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction first. So my name's Niall. Uh, I'm a co-founder at Select. We're building a SaaS app to help people who are using Snowflake get better return on investment, reduce their spend, improve efficiency, and, and get the best performance they can. Uh, I've recently become a Snowflake data superhero, uh, which, which is an amusing title. You can Google that if you want. Um, and previously, I was a data engineer at Brooklyn Data Co., and before that, Tails and Nested, which are two startups in London. All right, let's 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 dive in. So today, we're going to be kind of focusing on two things. First is performance, and the second is reducing costs. Um, and so I've categorized these into uh, like this. So under look at performance, we've got live dashboard usage and interaction. So we can think of that as People who come to look at, they're looking at dashboards, they're building explores. How do we make that experience really snappy? Um, and in the latter part on the Snowflake costs, we're gonna be looking through how Snowflake builds, warehouse configuration, um, and how we can identify long running queries, which are causing warehouses to, to run for long periods of time and, and what we can do about them. Okay, let's, let's start with performance. So to, to make that experience really quick for users who are coming to, to look at to view dashboards, uh, build new looks, use explores, it, it kind of comes down to a real simple thing. Like we want to we minimize the work that Snowflake is having to do in the background. Uh, and the two key ways that we do that are by reducing the amount of data that's, that's scanned. So that's read from storage, read from tables and then reducing the amount of work that Snowflake has to do with that data once it's read it. And that's really down to reducing query complexity and simplifying uh, and, and helping Snowflake perform that as fast as possible. 
So let's start with this first group of uh, optimizations around reducing data scout. So a bit of background on, on why this is important. So Snowflake uses a proprietary data format that's called a micro partition. Um, this is a format that they've developed themselves. Uh, it's completely internal. You can't find that much information about it. Um, but I'm going to share some interesting facts today. Um, and the important thing is that query performance is really accelerated when as few micro partitions as possible are scanned or read. It's the same thing. And that process of reducing the number of micro partitions that are ran is, is uh, are scanned is called pruning. So this is a, a bit of a sketch of what a, what a micropartition looks like. I don't know what it actually looks like, but it's a, it's a good model for understanding what they look like. Um, so a micropartition is what's called a hybrid columnar table format. And what that means is that the data is sliced both by row, by rows, sorry, a collection of rows, and by column within each micropartition. And that's really important because it means that when you query a table for only a specific selection of columns or rows, Snowflake is able to retrieve as little data as possible. So if you're only selecting one column, Snowflake's only gonna to have to look at that one column and return it. It's not having to get the whole table back. Um, and because network transfer is really slow, this is really important. And so in this example here, we can kind of see there are like four columns in this imaginary table. Each one of those columns is stored separately and can be retrieved individually. And the micro partition has some metadata that is storing for each of those columns as well. Um, and we'll come on to that metadata a little bit more in a bit when we talk about um, clustering. So how do we reduce the data that's, that's scanned? These, the number of micro partitions that are being pulled from storage and the number of columns. So filter wherever possible and as early as possible. This is really important. Um, we want to use pre-aggregated tables as well, wherever we can. So if, uh, if a dashboard is just pulling aggregate numbers and like most of the business is reporting is based on aggregates, those queries can be sped up considerably by, by reading from a pre-aggregated table. So rather than reading from the, the raw data, the raw table, and having to do those aggregates on the fly as everyone uses the dashboard, if we pre-aggregate that data, all of a sudden there's considerably less that has to be both read from storage by Snowflake and processed. Um, and I'd recommend looking at a feature in Looker called aggregate awareness for this. So Looker can kind of intelligently work out which table to use depending on the dimensions that have been pulled into, into an explore. Um, so if you're just using high level, say like uh, a date dimension, you can tell Looker to just use the daily roll-up table. And then if people go down to more finer grains, Looker will switch over to that um, uh, more granular table where, as needed. But what that means is you kind of get the best performance um, where, you, where you don't need that level of detail. Um, and we also, I'd also recommend exploring clustering for commonly used filters. And we'll talk about that a bit more at the end because we've got a, we've got a technique that you can use to identify the columns to cluster on. Okay, and this is uh, an example of the Snowflake query profile. So this is a really great tool for understanding why a query might be running slowly. Um, and you, you can visit this through the Snowflake UI. Um, and what I've got here just, is just a really basic example of how you can identify how, uh, how, how well Snowflake is pruning a query. So in this example, it's a really simple query. This one is literally just doing a select star from table. What we can see is that the query took 14 seconds um, and in the bottom right there where, we, where we've got the statistics, then the total number of partitions are 192 and all 192 were read. So it's expected, right? Because we selected from the entire table. Um, but if we add this filter in, all of a sudden the query is considerably quicker and we've only read two of the partitions. So exactly what you have to filter by depends on the clustering key of the table. And I'll talk a bit more about that now. So this, this term clustering, that describes how data is distributed across those micro partitions. 
and pruning is achieved when um, the columns, which are well clustered, have been filtered on. Um, and so a, a table that's described as well clustered has only a small range of values in each micropartition for those clustered columns. So if we imagine that we have an orders table, for example, um, on the right hand side, we've got all of these micropartitions that are sort of the table. And on the left hand side is the, the kind of tabular representation of that data. Um, in this example here, we're, we're imagining that there are only three rows per micropartition. In reality, there are like thousands, if not more. Um, but what we can see here is that each micropartition has only a very narrow range of created app values. And I'll explain kind of how you get into this state on the next slide. But for now, let's just assume that each micropartition has only a small range of values. So if I run a query that says select from this orders table where created at is greater than um, 2022 08 15, say, Snowflake can quickly identify that only three of those micro partitions in the table are relevant to the query that I submitted. And so what it will do is it will prune away all of those remaining micro partitions, which it knows don't contain relevant data. And that's going to make the query considerably quicker to run. So how do we get to this state where this table is, is well clustered on a particular column? So there are three ways that I, I like to use this, to categorize this. The first is natural insert ordering. Or ordering. Um, and the great thing about this type of clustering is you don't have to do anything. So if we imagine this orders table, every day we have some kind of ETL process, which is loading data into the table. Um, the only data that's getting inserted is new data which is going to have a new recent created at value just, just because it's new data, right? Um, and as those rows are inserted into the table, Snowflake is creating new micro partitions. And what that means is we end, in this, end up in this, in this state where the micro partitions are naturally clustered on that created at column. So we don't have to do anything. We don't have to recluster the table or pay for the automatic clustering service. That table is just naturally really nicely clustered on the created at column. And so it can be queried and filtered really effectively on it. Um, you can't always rely on, on uh, the natural insert order, which is what these next two options are all about. So the second option is manually sorting a table. So in the same way that the, the first uh, natural insert ordering clustering type works, rather than just uh, relying on the natural insert order, we can just manually sort the table by a specific column. So if we think of an example of like a, a DBT model or a look at PDT, every time that table is replaced, if we just add an order by clause at the bottom of that query, which just says, say, order by created app for the example of the orders table, or maybe uh, you have a dashboard which is commonly filtering on um, customer ID. If we order by that column, the table is going to be clustered on that column. And so again, it will be really, really effective to filter against. And then the final option is the automatic clustering service. So this is a feature within Snowflake, which uh, keeps tables well clustered by a specified either column or expression. Um, so, so far I've just been kind of mentioning that you can cluster by a specific column, but you can actually cluster by any number of columns. The, diff the, the only thing is that um, because this isn't like an index in a database, this is literally just the, the ordering of the columns, um, you, they are kind of sorted in order. So if you imagine someone uh, wanting to cluster on both created app and customer ID, it's going to order by created app first and then customer ID. So the thing that's the best clustered is always like the first column and then so on and so on. And so what that means is depending on the table, um, once you've reached a certain number of columns that you're clustering by, they just don't become very effective anymore because they're still so sort of randomly distributed across all of the previous clustered columns. And I'm happy to talk more about this in Slack because it gets quite complicated. Um, so the automatic clustering service is great because it, it takes care of this clustering for you. You don't need to worry about sourcing tables. Snowflake just handles it. Um, the downside is, of course, it's a, a service that you're having to pay for. Um, and this is a kind of more expensive technique than just sorting the table. Um, so if you if you have a table which you know 
is just being updated once a day by a model or some kind of process, I would recommend sorting it manually. Otherwise, if it's having fairly frequent inserts um, or it's, it's unpredictable, the automatic clustering service might be the, the better choice. But keep an eye on, on the cost of, of running automatic clustering and the performance benefits as well, just to see if it's worth it. Cool, so within Looker, if you're curious to understand which are the most commonly filtered columns, um, you can use the System Activity Explore to identify common query filters. Um, so there's a bit of a limitation here that it actually shows you both the filter column and the value in here. So what it won't show you is like the most commonly filtered column. It will show you the most commonly filtered uh, column and value, but you should still be able to get some uh, rough direction from that on what the most frequently filtered columns are. If you wanted to, you could um, pull this data out and then pass it out to identify just the columns and not the values. But I'd recommend checking this out. Okay, let's move on from uh, from clustering and data scans onto, onto queries. So why would we want to reduce query complexity? Um, Snowflake translates every query that you write and all of the steps within that query into what's called an execution plan. And that's something which uh, can then be run on the virtual warehouse that you're using. And so the more operations that are in your query, the more steps that are in that plan, um, and the more operations that Snowflake needs to perform to answer your query. Um, and every single step has a fixed time overhead in terms of moving data across those processes within the query, in addition to the work that it's performing. So as much as you possibly can, you want to aim to keep live queries really simple. Um, so filtering and aggregating only. Of course, that's not always possible. And so sometimes you will need to do kind of window functions and things like that. But as, as much as you can, keep live queries simple and do complex logic ahead of time in pre-aggregated tables. Um, so we're familiar with derived tables in Looker. Um, these can be used in two ways, either temporary or persisted. So persisted tables uh, are really useful because that calculation isn't being recalculated every time you're using the view. Um, temporary derived tables, on the other hand, are calculated every time you're using that view. And so if you have any complex calculations in there, every time someone's viewing a dashboard, they're going to be recalculated every time. All right, I think that concludes this section. So let's move on to costs now. Um, and it kind of goes without saying, but all of these things, as well as making the query faster, they reduce cost, right? Because Billing is proportional to the, to the time. So as a kind of byproduct of making stuff quicker, you can often make it cheaper. All right. So let's first understand how Snowflake's billing model works. This is really important. Um, so Snowflake charges for every second that a virtual warehouse is active with a minimum of 60 seconds. So if we have a query that runs for just one second and then no other query queries run for 60 seconds, Snowflake is always going to charge you at least 60 seconds. Um, but if your auto suspend setting is higher than 60 seconds, you'll keep getting billed until that warehouse is suspended. So what's the impact of that? Um, well, it means that if you have a long auto suspend time, you're probably being charged for virtual warehouses, which are being, uh, which are just sitting idle and not processing queries, but, but still in a billable state. Um, and generally we want to just absolutely uh, maximize the efficiency of that warehouse. So that means we want to maximize the time that the warehouse is running queries versus the time that it's billable for. And something which can catch people out is the, the PDT and data group maintenance schedule. Um, so this is a feature within Looker which you can use to uh, identify when the data in your warehouse has updated. Um, and when it has, according to a specific query that you provide Looker, Looker is then going to run all of the persisted drive tables that sit on top of that data group. The idea is that you have um, as low latency PDT re refreshes as possible. But the downside of running that every five minutes is uh, that it's potentially keeping the warehouse running for a long time. 
Um, and especially if you're using a warehouse which is quite large, you could end up with a warehouse which is running like at least 20% of the time, or, or at least in a billable state for 20% of the time based on that minimum 60 second period. So um, I would recommend reducing this five minute period if you're using uh, PDTs and data groups. The challenge then of course, is that you're going to have uh, lower latency between when the data in the warehouse updates and, and when Looker updates. So as best as possible, try and align uh, that maintenance schedule with the upstream data refreshes, say in DBT. Um, and where possible, split PDTs with a, which require a larger warehouse onto their own warehouse. So a separate warehouse to all of the live queries that are running in your account. Um, and you can do that under the uh, Looker Snowflake connection. I believe you can only set a single warehouse across all PDTs and all views. I'm sure Dylan can correct me at the end, um, which is uh, a bit restrictive, but just worth bearing in mind. Uh, you can still split PDTs onto their own warehouse. Um, and the general goal here is to run queries on the, the smallest possible warehouse that they are running acceptably quickly on. Okay. So once we've sorted out all this configuration, um, the next thing we want to look at is long running queries. So the system activity explorer can be helpful again here. Um, it will show you the total runtime by dashboard, which you can then use to kind of rank the slowest dashboards in your account by total runtime. And these are the dashboards which are probably worth optimizing because people are waiting for them to load, but they're also the ones that are driving the most spend as well, because they're the ones that are keeping the warehouse running. So once you've identified those, head back to the performance slides and see what you can do to, to optimize them. And here's a bit of an example of how you can use the System Activity Explorer again. So we've used the dimensions of dashboard ID and title, and then ordered those by the total runtime descending. Okay, that concludes all of my uh, content that I had. So I can see some questions popping up. Awesome. Uh, now, thank you very much. Um, yeah, as you said, we can jump into some questions right now. So let me let me pull some of those up. Um, so we got first one from Eric, uh, which is, are all the clustering techniques essentially doing the same thing? So you mentioned natural insert, sorting the DBT model or PDT, and automatic clustering. Um, and he's saying, like, are those all doing the same thing? Or, or asked another way, is there a performance benefit to one technique over the other, assuming they're all done correctly? So the end state of each of them is the same, right? You end up with these micro partitions which are well clustered on the column that you need. Um, the difference really is in uh, kind of configurability and, and how they're run. So the natural insert order, obviously you're, you're restricted to the, the natural insert of the table. So if you need to cluster on a different column, that's, you just can't use natural insert ordering. You need to follow one of the other two methods. So between sorting and automatic clustering, the easy button is automatic clustering. You know, you, you don't really have to think about when you're going to do the sort, uh, how you're going to run the sort. Snowflake just takes care of it for you, which is obviously really beneficial. Um, as I said, the kind of downside of that is that Snowflake charges you more for that than if you just do the sort yourself. They're having to charge like a bigger margin because it's a like a managed service. Um, so if this is a big table, which is being frequently updated, you might end up with high costs because that automatic clustering service is kind of continually running and churning through the data to cluster the table. If you sort it manually, you have full control um, over both when that clustering happens. Uh, well, I guess that really, when it happens, that's the kind of key thing. So if you find that uh, a table is being frequently updated, over time, the clustering of that table is going to degrade, but it might be kind of okay for a week, in which case you only need to resort that table once every week. On the other hand, the automatic clustering service is just gonna continually update that table. So even if it's like good enough, it's going to keep running and keep charging you. So that that's really the kind of difference. It's about how much control you have, but also um, how much overhead there is for you to manage as well. 
it's it's a complex one, but uh, I'd recommend starting with automatic clustering. And if you find it's too expensive, consider doing manual sorting. Awesome, thanks now. Um, on the next one, uh, one I don't know the answer to, what kind of data types, integers, date strings are better for clustering? Does that impact either the cost or the degree to which Snowflake can prune it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't, in terms of, I guess it depends what you mean by better. I mean, the best thing to cluster by is the column that you're most frequently filtering on, right? Um, I guess once you've got there, is the question more around like what what data type could that, should that column be if you can choose? I guess if it I is. I guess so. It's like if you've got a customer name and a customer ID that's an integer, is it better And you're, you know, is is ordering on one or the other identical or, or is Snowflake going to do anything under the hood there? I'd say it doesn't really matter. The one place that this uh, that, that Snowflake do recommend one over the other is if you have say um, say timestamps. What you can end up happening is that Snowflake is going to. But uh, this comes down to like a cardinality, okay? Which is a way of describing the number of distinct values in the column. If you cluster a column which has got just an absolute ton of distinct values, with the automatic clustering service especially, there's a lot more work that's having to be done to maintain that ordering. Whereas if you go for something like a date, obviously there are fewer dates than there are timestamps. And so there's less work to do. So it can potentially be cheaper than a timestamp. Um, but otherwise, I kind of think don't don't really worry about it is, is my, yeah. If, if, if it becomes a problem, you'll probably realize and then uh, and then look into options. But otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yeah. Um uh, one that I can probably answer here from David. Are the system activity explorers you showed pre-built? Uh, if so, can you show how to navigate them? Uh, yeah, David, those are um, the system activity explorers come as part of a Looker instance. Um, you either need developer permissions or admin permissions to, um, to see it. And I can't remember off the top of my head which it is. Um, and you can obviously create a custom role to, to do that differently. But those explorers are pre-built. So you don't need to write any code. Um, we wrote those queries ourselves. So those are, are actually queries from the Spectacles Looker instance or a demo one that we have. Um, and so you have to go in and like build the query yourself and, and you've got tons of flexibility there, but the explorers themselves are, are pre-built and good to go. Um, and so just make sure you've got the right permission. And then if you click in the top right, uh, top left corner of Looker, explore, and then look for the system activity model, um, you'll see it all there. Um, there's a ton of stuff. I think we all, both examples we showed today are from the history uh, yeah, the history explorer in the system activity model, but there's actually a ton of other ones that show you a whole range of things around Looker performance. You can build pretty complex reporting if you, you know, um, if you really, really wanted to. Um, Niall, one for you. Are there any resources for people who want to, you know, do a deep dive into the topics discussed? Yes. That's other than you know, and, and, and you reminded me to plug my uh, blog that I haven't done yet. I'm, I'm going to put this in the Zoom chat. Um, we write extensively about Snowflake performance over on the Select uh, blog. So I'm just going to drop that in um, in Zoom and in Slack. So um, yeah, please go and check that out. We've got a mailing list on there as well where we, we drop out regular Snowflake optimization tips. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, another question from David, which is, do you ever use the performance recommendations dashboard, which I think is in uh, in Looker. Um, I can say from my personal point of view that I end up tending to like build my own dashboards and just going directly to the explorers myself. There's definitely a ton of stuff that Looker gives pre-built, but I think often um, we're kind of like trying to do something very specific. And I've just found that it's it's easier to go to, to the explorers directly and, and do it ourselves. I mean, that's it's a personal preference thing. Um, but there is a lot of stuff. If you're an admin in Looker, there's a bunch of stuff that you can see there in the admin section that kind of Looker uses Looker within Looker to show you stuff built on the system activity. Um, and is, is definitely worthwhile as a, as a starting place for, for all this stuff. Um, cool. Uh, probably got time for a couple more. Um, Niall, one for you. Do you have any recommendations or best practices on using multi-clustered warehouses with an economy scaling policy to reach a good balance between cost and performance? Um, basically, any recommendations on warehouse size for Looker uh, usage under the strategy? So basically, kind of like, how do you think about multi-clustered and the scaling policy, and and I guess how to select interact with that as a as a service as well? Sure. 
Yeah, great question. Um, I think generally I'd, I'd reiterate the point I made before, which is use the smallest possible warehouse size that the queries run um, effectively on. In terms of scaling policy, I've experimented with both the standard and the economy scaling policy. Um, I've always found the economy scaling policy is both slow to add additional clusters and also slow to remove them as well. Um, so kind of like not, not that great in my experience. So on that basis, I would recommend using the standard policy, um, especially if this is a kind of customer, so a user facing dashboard, um, you don't want people waiting around while additional clusters get spun, spun up. So the standard's the way to go because that's going to add clusters really quickly. Um, and in terms of select, we we have a feature that we call smart suspension and smart scaling. And what that does is kind of monitor the workloads over time and do a more intelligent uh, approach to both when to add clusters and also suspend the warehouse. Um, and that's saving our early access users a ton of money. So if anyone's interested in that, reach out. Um, like at least 10% on a compute spend without an impact on performance. Awesome. Uh, I think we've got two more here. Um, is there a webinar out there that demos aggregate awareness? Uh, or if not, can it be a topic in the future? Um, I actually don't know personally of one that covers this in a ton of depth. I, I think I agree with the sentiment to the question that I think there isn't a ton of good resources around this. I think the team at Montreal Analytics may have done uh, some stuff on there. I know some of them are on the call today. So if if, uh, if that is true, I'm very happy for you guys to post this as an answer uh, to this in Slack. Um, but Marissa, it is definitely something that I think we're going to do some stuff on in the future because it's a, a really powerful tool that I think is underexplained and maybe a little under leveraged in Looker um, and certainly something that I think we'll get on on the schedule in the future. Um, perfect. Let's do one last question from Devin. Uh, Nihilus for you. Can you talk about warehouse side outside of not spilling data? Um, kind of how how should you be thinking where, warehouse side or, or, uh, apart from that? And um, is Select ever going to do something with automatic vertical scaling? Uh, yes, we absolutely want to build that. That's something we're planning on building in the next month or two is around uh, automatically determining the best warehouse size and scaling up and scaling down as needed. Um, as of right now, like the, the really the best measure is around spilling data. So typically, I mean, the best way to approach warehouse sizing really is to put, like I mentioned before, the, the smallest warehouse size possible. So ideally you want to be redirecting queries which need a bigger warehouse to that bigger warehouse and then keep everything else on the smallest one as possible. That is tricky with Looker because you only have two ways of checking the warehouse, checking the warehouse size. Is that right, Dylan? I know I said that before. It's like one size for all live queries and one for PDCs is kind of as granular as you can get. So that you can get slightly more granular. It's I, I'm pretty sure just one for PDTs. The way that you can get slightly more granular is you can use user attributes for all of the non-PDT queries. So in theory, you can get as granular as every user having their own warehouse. But warehouse it's still size. per user, right? It's not like per and, dashboard or right. It's still on a at least as far as I'm aware on a on a per user basis. And so notionally, you can do kind of like slightly over the top things, in my opinion, like letting users control the size of warehouse they're running on by controlling their user attributes and like putting instructions in a dashboard that tells people to change it. But um, <laughs> like, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. And so, yeah, you're basically what you've said. Uh, so yeah, aside from that, spillage is the biggest giveaway as, as to when a warehouse size is too small. If you're seeing remote disk spillage, which I didn't mention in this talk, but um, I've talked about in a, in a post that I linked, uh, which I can link, around warehouse sizing. If you're seeing remote spillage to disk, that's just a kind of dead giveaway. The warehouse size is too small um, and you should increase it. Other than that, Snowflake don't provide statistics around CPU or memory usage, unfortunately. Um, I think we've got two uh, two more that I'll, we'll try to answer quickly. Um, have you ever played with Looker connection parameters and particular things like max connections per node? Um, I personally have not done a ton of this with Snowflake and Looker. Niall, I don't know if this is something you've played around with before. I haven't. Sorry. Yeah. No. Um, Tom, if you if you end up going down that path or want to talk about this more, I think it's a thing we'd be happy to definitely happy to like talk about and go through. Um, either drop us a message or, or join the Slack, whichever, um, whatever you want. Uh, but yeah, not something that we've both. Uh, 
uh, not something we've both dealt with a ton before. Um, and then I thought another question coming, but actually just uh, a recommendation from Jake, which is using user attributes, give, Excel, uh, give execs uh, the user group, the Excel warehouse user attributes, so they don't have to wait around for queries as much as lowly peons around the organization. Um, yeah, if you're uh, if you're dealing with uh, slow performance, a way to at least keep the the big wigs happy is to use user attributes to just let them run on a much larger warehouse. Um, and then when they complain about the bill, you can explain to them that it's their own fault, uh, which is <laughs> nice for accountability. Um, awesome. Um, I think that's where we're going to call it uh, today. Um, First off, Niall, thank you very much. This has been super interesting and, and really glad we were able to get you on the webinar today. Um, Thanks I'm so sure much. In the future, uh, we'll, we'll get you back on again. Uh, and then to everyone attending, um, we continue to have really great turnout for, for all of these. So a uh, really big thank you to all of you for, um, for doing that. Um, uh, please, uh, kind of as some of you have today, if you have topics that you'd like us to cover in the future, please get in touch. Um, we're really happy. We're, you know, we both know Looker really well. So there's lots of things that we would be happy to talk about or find people to talk about. Um, and so please do get in touch. Uh, and additionally, if you want to host one in the future as well, we've, um, you know, a couple of these coming up where, where people getting in touch and, and, you know, offering to talk about something interesting that they've done with Looker at their organization, please do that as well. Um, and even if it's only like a half-baked half -baked idea, happy to work with you and um, kind of get it to a webinar or whatever it may be. Um, and uh, thank you now for moving to the next slide. Um, join us for our upcoming webinars. So uh, map visualizations in two weeks and then multi-instance scaling uh, two weeks after that. And uh, probably in the next week, we'll be announcing a, a couple more um, kind of from April or all onwards. Um, so once again, thank you, Niall. Thank you to all of you. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. If you have any more questions, uh, drop them in, in Slack. And if any of you want a demo of Spectacles, uh, get in touch. Um, not really what these webinars are for, but uh, or select uh, if you're if you're dealing with significant uh, snowflake costs, go have a, a chat with Niall and the team there um, because they'll be able to to help you out. Awesome. See everyone in a Thanks few so weeks. Much.